at some point. I do want to go through the usual reminders and disclaimers. This session is being recorded audio only. Uh, video and audio participations are options. Chat is disabled um, for the journalistic, promotional, and or commercial purposes of Unfound. The audio recording of this digital meeting will be distributed by Unfound by participating in this, this digital meeting. You agree to give unfound permission to use the audio recording of your words for journalistic, promotional, and or commercial purposes with no compensation to you from unfound, its assistants, its affiliates, its partners, etc. As some or all of you know, episode number one and number two are now available on the YouTube channel, so please um, share that material. And, uh, you know, we are trying to have output there that's helpful for public learning. Again, a special thanks to all of our Think Tank members for their ongoing participation and feedback. I did finally get around to sending the references out for number two, and I will soon get those out from the first episode and eventually will follow with the references from the third episode tonight. And uh, of course, Natasha is creating web space for these and you get those by email. So that's for due diligence of documentation as well as our ongoing learning and usage. So that's important. Uh, just a reminder, unless you're talking as possible, try to keep your mic muted, whether that's locally or through Zoom. If you can't figure it out and there's no feedback issues, don't worry about it. Again, Eric Rabowski is my name. Um, I am uh, <clears throat> part of the assisting team for Unfound. I've been a guest on Unfound once, and uh, my academic area is communication. Uh, but beyond my work in teaching and studying human communication, I do cold case journalism. And as stated before, my words tonight tonight do not reflect the views necessarily of my employing university. And again, feel free to provide any disclaimers that you need to provide throughout the evening. The unfoundpodcast.com, the unfoundpodcast.com is the great website um, that the unfound team, particularly Ed and Natasha, um, are working on consistently. And uh, share that, visit that. That's the, the flagship of the flagship. Of course, again, think about Unfound as a framework or a platform. The, the, the podcast episodes are primary. And then now sort of everything fits together in this wonderful platform or framework, including this work. I do want to refer to uh, a lot of the great discussion that we had from number two, episode number two, which is sourced broadly gives us, we wanted to, to keep moving forward with some specific discussion of, of finding people. So keep that out there. Um, some things just really quickly that we, we wanted to keep in terms of some of our big picture thinking, right? We're interested in accuracy, accurately finding people, corroboration, deep research. Don't forget about safety and security when you're engaged in this kind of work, whether it's journalism, advocacy, awareness raising, right? You have to be attentive to, to your safety and to your household. Remember, as much as we can find out information about people, they can find it about us. So be attentive to those, those issues, right? We're, we're talking about building rapport and respect. Um, when we're, we're getting excited about talking to people and, and trying to develop and find those human sources, we have that sense of urgency because we're really, really interested in solving the cases. We're you know, the, one of the great things about the Unfound brand is it's not about sensationalism. It's, it's not just about clicks. It's really about solving cases, trying to get to the heart of the matter, the truth, right? And of course, we, we know that issues of diplomacy and timing and clarity, et cetera, are important. And the things that we talk about tonight, although we're thinking about it maybe from a, a journalistic lens, um, again, whether you're doing awareness, advocacy, et cetera, all of that is, is relevant. Research and analysis, analysis, putting together that big picture, that's where talking to people becomes so important. Um, and and, and we, last 
episode, you know, we, we learned that when we're talking about the missing, but also those persons who might be able to help us learn more about what happened, right? We have to have an understanding of context, culture, et cetera. Lastly, as I often say, someone out there knows something or know someone who knows something. So let's keep that in mind. I did want to start out because this, our own collaboration is key before I jump into some prepared material. I do want to start on the front end with my second guiding question, right? For finding people, right, who, who are or can potentially be human sources, which websites or website? would you recommend for researching information about people, including, of course, contact information? So let's just get some of that out there to get some conversation going, and then we'll, we'll move back to, to the prepared material. Tanya, I'm going to start with you. Again, if you pass, that's okay, but I'll, I'll go through everyone. Okay, that's okay. Cherie, we'll go to you. You're an expert in this area. Are there any websites that you would recommend as great resources? Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> um, of course, you could use Facebook to look for people. Um, I mean, I use Been Verified sometimes to find people. Um, Ancestry. Okay. You know, all of the social media, Twitter, Instagram. Okay. Great. And we'll do more on, on social media. Uh, can I ask you one question? When you use been verified, that is a site that allows some quote unquote free material out there. And then of course it's trying to, to sell further information. Um, if you want to share, are you a subscriber or do you rely on the quote unquote free? No, I am a subscriber, but it, I mean, it's not, I wouldn't say, I would say that it's only accurate like 70% of the time. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know that it's necessarily worth paying to be some, you know, for that one time that you do actually find somebody through it, it's worth it. Yeah. But, you know, you have to weigh the pros with the cons. Yeah. Now, one of the things I, and since we brought it up, I'm going to mention one of the things I've noticed, and I do not subscribe to it. And when you try to use a paid site that gives some free information, what I have found, and, and maybe it's just, I'm, I'm misguided, but it seems to me that if I want to check to see what's on bit, been verified, I will go to Google and I'll put in the way it's rendered, been verified, one word, space, and then with or without quotes, any information I know, like a name, a full name, et cetera. Uh, and then that sort of pops me up because they're trying to come up and search with things that might be a hook, right? So at that point, that gets me right to what I need there. Because if I just go to Ben Verify and try to search, doesn't it get more clunky? Right, yeah, I would agree with that. So that's worked for me. I yeah, I would yeah, say so that... Um, you know, some, there has definitely been instances where we have been able to find phone numbers to contact people using that site. Personally, it has happened. Yeah. But there's also been numerous occasions where the information was useless. So sometimes it's outdated, you know, right? Right. Right. Yeah, which is great if you're building a historical perspective, but if you're trying to cut, find someone now uh, and they've moved from a residence from three years ago and you can't find their number, that's not very helpful. So exactly. thank you, Cherie. Yep. Uh, Delane, is there any websites you want to suggest? Okay, passing's okay. Nothing wrong with that. Jessica, how about you? I'm going to pass. Okay, not wrong with that. Um, let's go to Kathy. Any websites you'd like to suggest? Okay, can you can you hear me, Eric? I can hear you. 
Okay, I'll make sure I'm doing this right. Okay, um, beyond what Cherie mentioned, I usually use, I don't, I don't pay for any sites or anything, but uh, currently, and since I'm retired, I don't, some of the things I used at work, but I don't have any access to social security numbers or anything, but um, I use any, any who and white pages most of the time. And then sometimes I'll put the name of the person in Google and then like my life might come up. I've used some of those. But again, you have to make sure as far as if you're getting, like if the person has a common last name, if you're getting the right person, you've got to be really careful with that. So yeah. That's what I do just as a, just having these different members or trying to find friends. That's what I have mostly used. Yeah. Nope. That's helpful. We're building a list. Very helpful. Natasha, anything you'd like to suggest for this question, just in terms of specific websites? Hi, Eric. Sure. There's, um, of course, Mamus.gov, and I use that quite a bit uh, in my videos. Uh, I create the videos for the Unfound podcast, the audio episodes, yeah. and I really turn to that as the go-to credible source. It's fantastic. Uh, usually they're in there, and uh, I download the missing poster that you can create, um, obviously for free once you register. The missing poster is in English and Spanish. So uh, I put that in the video. And the more that the victim's information gets out there and the pictures, the better. Thank you. Yeah, and there's, the, so NamUs can be an awareness raising uh, framework, uh, a historical, or contextual case framework, but it also can be a great starting point on uh, deciding whom to reach out to because once I know that information, I can begin to build outward. Um, and if you're someone who, and again, we're, we're not, depending on your view, right, whether you want to talk to family or friends or law enforcement or other media, right, so whether it's Charlie Project or NamUs, you have a starting point. Now, again, some of what we're talking about tonight is building from the last episode and getting more specific, but sometimes in the course of research, you find a name and it's like, wow, I really need to talk to that person. So we often stumble upon those names in multiple ways, but yeah, NamUs, Charlie Project, because part of this, and this is something I'll be emphasizing tonight, and whether you're thinking in terms of genealogy or, or, or location, proximity, right, you're building a picture. You're, you're piecing things together. So yeah, you can never discount those sorts of sites. Let me mention a few while we're here. And some of you, of course, mentioned some that I had in mind. So we're, we're not gonna be too redundant on that. But of course, some of the things we'll be mentioning tonight have to do, especially if you're looking to, to find someone, um, you know, um, trying to decide where someone's at, what information you have, what connections, uh, what information's dated, outdated. One is Zaba, Z-A-B-A, search.com. Now that's going to be more like a, a white pages or, or a um, been verified. Uh, it's best to search by state, although you don't always have to do that depending upon the uniqueness of the name. Zabasearch.com. They've been around for a while now. Once in a while, they will have numbers or at least an address um, that might or might not be found elsewhere. Now they are advertising. They're trying to, to you know, monetize, which again is fine. Does it, there's never a guarantee you're going to find, but if you can search by name and you have a location, you might be able to find a phone number or at least an address. So zabasearch.com. And some of you mentioned whitepages.com. Remember, although sometimes even people have unlisted numbers, sometimes not all of their material is thrown into the unlisted category. You might find an address or a location even without a number. By the way, on white pages, sometimes you can also find, um, sometimes you can also find the um, uh, affiliates, right? That it says may be related to, or, or it might have some other connection. 
So that comes up, at least it used to on white pages. I haven't, I haven't tracked that as closely as I should, but it, it sometimes starting basic is, is helpful. Um, there's a few others I'll mention. There's one I'm going to put out there right now. Um, in the last year or two, I've used it here, maybe two. Fastpeoplesearch.com. Fastpeoplesearch.com. Um, they have implemented a security protocol, I noticed. I don't know if that's just because of certain internet connections or just because of the nature of the site. So they might ask, ask you to do a when you visit the site. But once you're in, you can search by name. You can search by phone number. You can search by address. Uh, they're obviously dealing with aggregated information. However, they do that in a proprietary way. Um, it can really give you a lot of information. Now, of course, you have to go through that corroboration and double checking and such. But if you have enough information, then you can usually get some phone numbers or some, they even sometimes bring up email addresses uh, affiliations, etc. Has anyone here ever used fastpeoplesearch.com? Okay, so that's that's one for sure. Fastpeoplesearch.com. So as we can see, right, and, and there are others that we'll mention. As we can see, right, there are a lot of resources out there. And as I mentioned before we got started, right, one of my weaknesses, of course, is staying organized. And um, as Delane mentioned before we got started, right? We we we. It's also an important skill set or th th uh, idea set is is different ways. And I don't know if tonight we'll get to that. Maybe that's a whole other discussion. But right, what are some tips for for keeping all this organized? Right, if you're looking for people, you're finding all these great sites, you're you're taking notes, and so whether you're using these digital tools or you have your own notebooks, that's that using that technology to to stay organized is is really important. I wanted to talk about, and we're going to obviously talk more together, but um, on my end, um, a great, and I mentioned this before, I think, but, and I'm going to mention, you know, two early cases for me, and one you're aware of, the Donna Michaelanko case, I've mentioned that episode, and, um, but probably the first cold case and it's the death of Larry Phoebus. Now that's not a missing persons case. That is a homicide. And um, like Donna's case, it's, it's one of the earlier um, cold cases listed on the North Dakota Attorney General's website on nd.gov. And uh, you know, I, I like these historical cases. And so when you're dealing with cases that are older, right? And, and some of this crosses over to the newer cases too. Um, you're dealing with uh, the movement of time. People move, people die, um, families expand, right? And that's just part of the journeys of life. And so like with any case, right, you're starting with what you know, right? What do I have available? What's been said? What media reports are there? Um, and of course, sometimes um, you can start to gather a bit of a profile. And, and I would say with any case, new or old, one way to, to think about not just the, per, the, the victim or, 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 but also those folks that you're looking to find, right? Start to build a, a genealogical profile. Um, and, and beyond just genealogy, what are some of the other relationships? If there's family members or friends or community people that I want to talk to. Now, some people aren't very difficult to find. And uh, of course, with the Phoebus case, and by the way, uh, at some point, I'll be putting together a, a, a longer uh, write-up uh, on my own site on the Larry Phoebus case. Again, that's not a missing persons case, but that'll be on coldcaseweb.com. But when I started with that case, and I, and I did at least once visit near the area where, where Larry and his his brother were visiting. They were from out of state, visiting North Dakota, and um, Larry was was murdered. But of course, I I there were some people who were from that area, rural area, uh, that I was able to reach out to. Not very difficult, right? Because of the you know, whitepages.com or other such sites. But um, but one of the keys for me on that, and there's still a lot to learn about that case, right? This is from the early 1960s. 
But <clears throat> I, every time I talk, no, a lot of the times I talk to someone, right? Just often asking, right? Who else should I talk to, right? Because even with the older cases, when you're having that sense of urgency, right? So with Larry's case, right? And starting to get some names from some folks uh, from the area who lived in the area who might have some recollection. A lot of those folks were not very difficult to find. There, there are still a few folks uh, from that time who I'm, who I'm still trying to find, but uh, that, that, that was not very difficult. So I sort of started with what was, I guess, easier. Doesn't mean that everyone had, was always willing to talk or always had their recollections, but that was an important place. But once I started through the document evidence and talking to some people, um, once I started to have that picture, right? And of course, as I mentioned before, a great place to talk to if you want to branch out. Keep in mind, Larry was not from North Dakota. They were in North Dakota, though, uh, is the obituary. Now, there are different places, and this wasn't Larry's obituary. This is an obit obituary from other people in his, his family, because over time, again, people die, people move, people get married, and looking at an obituary, and again, this is not to be morbid. This is just part of a the necessity of, of doing research, right? An obituary provides information. So, uh, you know, one of Larry's relatives, and it was someone who was older, I was able to, to track through a number of, of relatives and, and some over the years I have uh, communicated with in the family, some of whom wish to, to, you know, either be off the record or background or some weren't willing to talk maybe. Um, and the but having that information so once i had that that obituary remember often an obituary provides relationships uh married names maiden name or married names maiden names um, locations right because not everyone has daughters sons nieces grandkids whatever that live in the same place um, that provides something that you just create a list and start building from so if I know I'm looking for person A and person A was related to this person and thing, I can say, okay, at this point they lived in, you know, Texas or Alabama or Florida. Okay, well now I have a lead in, in terms of where I'm trying to find them. So obituaries are a great starting point. I know for the, the Phoebus case, that was important. Um, again, the case was from the early 1960s and it, reality was it was one of those cases where there wasn't a lot of, you know, there, to this day, there, as far as I know, um, you know, there hasn't been a lot of movement on the case. And so that was a big starting point for me. And again, like we talked about before, then I was able to, it wasn't really difficult to find a lot of the people just using some of the sites we've discussed, but uh, knowing who to find, right? And so then it's like, okay, find these folks and stay organized. Has anyone here ever used an obituary to, to, as a starting point? Uh, Eric, yeah. that was something I forgot to, that I omitted, and I thought of it right after I stopped talking, but I use obituaries quite a bit. Yeah. They can be, they can be very helpful. You're trying to locate somebody that you know, or these missing person things. Uh, you know, some people don't have an obituary, and death records, at least in California, are not public records. Yeah. So I, I found that out maybe a couple of years ago. So obituaries are really great if they do one. And yeah. thank you. Thank you for mentioning that because that is something I use quite a bit. Well, and Kathy, you and I are on the same wavelength because when you want to talk about how all this material crosses over uh, human sources, documentary resources, I have in my hand Larry's death certificate because in North Dakota, um, and I don't know the exact provisions of, of what range of years, but his death certificate, this is a, a copy. Of course, that provides um, important information, including some family information, right? And um, that is something uh, in terms of figuring out maybe who to talk to. And sometimes if it's something that's more current, now sometimes with more current cases, missing persons and otherwise, this information may not be readily available. But yes, I'm holding in my hand right here, uh, Larry's death certificate or certificate of death uh, that I was able to get from the North Dakota Department of Health. So often though, you can't get those. And so the, um, 
the obituaries provide material otherwise that you can't get. Anyone else have experience with obituaries? Okay, Every, if you're looking for people or trying to, to find people to look for, right? Every family has somewhere obituaries. And so they do mention uh, the things that I said before. So that was an important starting point for sure. Um, you know, the, the Donna Michelanco case, now that was, uh, again, there wasn't some of the, and this was again, uh, one of those North Dakota cases, this, this, as of now, the, one of the oldest, uh, least attorney general list cold cases, Donna's disappearance. We had an episode with Ed and, uh, again, uh, you know, the name, uh, Michael Lanco is, is unique, more unique than, you know, Smith. But um, <clears throat> on the other hand, right, and sometimes in certain parts of the country, you might find a lot of people with that name. So it's not like it's like calling anyone up on the phone might or might not be, you know, at least closely related. But I was able to, you know, using the white pages and, and other sites like that, was able to, to start to make them inroads. Um, and on the front end, there, there wasn't anyone that was incredibly difficult. And as you know, from Ed's the episode I did with Ed, I was able to, to, to have some substantive uh, communication with, with uh, aspect, uh, elements of, of the family. And some of that um, um, has and or will continue. But the interesting thing is too, another thing I've done is I've continued to um, on you know forums, genealogy websites, uh, and you know on on ancestry.com by the way, for those of you that use it, you can go into besides searching records, you can also go where they have um, the family trees that people post, and people will have some public material, some private material. A lot of it's public, and if you know of a of a name someone you're looking for, a case that you're looking uh, about, trying to find other family members. Well, why not look for the records of people that, that are pertaining to your case that you're looking for? And you can reach out to them through Ancestry, right? And say, you know, were you aware of this? Have you heard of this, right? So this is more about finding people to talk to and finding them, right? So that, that has been something that to at least track that so you can kind of watch that some people will reply back i don't know how many of you here use ancestry.com okay by the way it's it's a premium site they don't do a lot for free however if you have a local library there's a chance that you will if you're a member of that library in the library you might be able to use the ancestry library edition as part of your library membership so keep that in mind Right. So if you're looking for that, another good website for uh, building a genealogical profile to find someone is familysearch.org. Familysearch.org. That is run by the Mormons. They, you are not required to be a Mormon. I'm not a Mormon, but you're not required to be a Mormon to join that site. They do make you register now, though. Um, there are a lot of free records on there, including some of the very same uh, records that are on Ancestry, some different too. And some of them, as we'll see when I get to another running example, could be very helpful because on Ancestry and on Family Search, but probably more so on Ancestry, there are aggregated or compiled records, public records that they sometimes use. And I'm, I'm not talking about census. I'm, they sometimes will gather that and, they're, and they might be dated sometimes addresses or partial phone numbers, but that gives you locations. So if you're trying to find someone and you're trying to figure out where they're at or where they moved, some of that information might be dated five, 10, 15 years. That can help you roll things out and roll things in when you're looking for someone, right? Which can be very helpful, okay? One of the other things I've learned, and, it's not, and this is also helping out, out on the Remmer case, um, Obviously, you have certain information available to you. And, and of course, we know with that very long episode, Ed went into some, some great depth about how he acquired certain information. So when you have information available through documents or through 
through background or, or whatever. Uh, but remember, based on what you know, and you're looking to find someone, and, and, it, and sometimes it's just a simple case of, of going where the obvious may be, right? So in the case of one of the persons on that episode that was discussed, one of the security guards, right? Part of that process was simply calling the workplace where they were or where we thought they were and where they indeed at the time at least still were or are at the time. And I, when you call up looking for someone, I am not in any way saying you have to do anything deceptive or anything. It's just a matter of being clear. Hello, is such and such still there? Or how do I reach such and such? Right now, of course, when you're calling people, searching for people, sometimes questions will come up. What do you want to talk to them about, et cetera? Sometimes they won't. Sometimes it'll be simple. Oh, yeah, they're not in right now, which happened in that case, in that, that Remmer discussion, right? And that fit into a larger framework of searching that Ed and probably Cherie were doing as recounted on that episode. So sometimes just knowing, you know, if you if you're not sure where they're at, or if you if you're aware of where they they had worked or might work, or or whatever, just call up. It's such and such in. Sometimes you know it might be more simple than we think, so that's important to know too. Um, okay, I don't want to keep talking here without this interaction, for that's important. Um, it's before I get into a longer running example. Uh, does anyone else have a specific example? And again, you can you can keep it more explicit or, or more general, but a, a concrete or specific example that you used in materials and finding someone for a missing person's case. Delane, anything you'd like to share? I see your hand up. Well, yeah, I um, it had occurred to me earlier today, but I forgot to mention to it to you before we started the program was if you know a name and a general area, search and property tax records are a great resource. Yeah. And if their home has been sold, you can generally find the deed book number listed there and yeah. go to that page in the deed book. Yep. And they may even have their new address on the sales documents and the transfer of the deed. Yeah, that's a great one. And, and, and county, and those are usually held at the county level, right? They are, and they're generally free. And like I know here in Cumberland County, they went back and they scanned, you know, all of the old files. Yeah. So you have access to a lot of data. Yeah, that's 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 a very helpful suggestion. And and county, local government records can be very uh, can be very good resources, which then tells you why it's important to build that profile, that locational information. Because if you have a sense of where they live or where they might have lived for a time, then you can look to that sort of information. Thank you. Tanya, any specific lines of research that you'd like to share? Um, I was thinking uh, possibly yearbook.com because oh, wow. you can see friends of yeah. theirs and people maybe they've played sports with, you know, baseball, they've been in certain clubs with. Um, the Other than that, um, Google for local, for their local newspaper yeah. to see the articles. And I was going to mention to the property transfers, arrests, police and fire, marriage and divorce. Sometimes they might come up in those things as well. Yep. That, that is very relevant um, for sure. And understanding uh, that then gives some insights into who people, who, who people are connected to, who they're affiliated with, you know, and sometimes we, and I'm using the, the Michael Anko case here, during the uh, Ed's, and we'll keep the conversation going in a second. During Ed's episode, my episode with Ed, I mentioned that I had developed a contact close to the, close to the area who knew a little bit about the case. And, and he had suggested, hey, read this book, The Ultimate Evil, and um, did that, <clears throat> which of course got into a larger discussion about um, how certain um, cult activity uh, crossed over 
through a time at least North Dakota. Now, at this point, at this point, um, I would probably say that Donna's disappearance was not related to that. But after reading that book and then creating a list of names and, and actually tracking down to the extent possible, either some of those people or people that might have been familiar with some of the things mentioned in the book, um, I'm still, I'm at this point saying, okay, a lot of that activity was later than Donna's time. I have not seen anything that tells me it started earlier, although that's possible. Besides the documentary evidence and taking the time and a lot of time and trying to talk to some of these people that were either mentioned or were familiar with things in the book and or, um, I'm, I'm still at that place, right? That that activity probably wasn't related to um, Donna's disappearance but boy, it taught me a lot about that, that part of North Dakota and some things that were going on from, you know, Minot, North Dakota, down to Bismarck, North Dakota. And it's an adventure and it's interesting anyway. I'm not completely ruling that out, but it's probably not likely that that was part of it. But, but boy, I learned a lot. And, and so that talking to those people and, and finding those people, and there's still, still some people on that list I made that I'm still going to try to find. And, and, and that's, that's, that's important. And you can see how this could become an adventure, which, which, which again, like we've said before, whether you're looking at documents or you're trying to reach people, this is the stuff that keeps you up late at night. And we've all sort of talked about passion, right? Talked about passion. Cherie, is there a specific line of, of study or case that you'd like to make reference to? No, I mean, I think my process is a little bit, maybe it's odd. I don't know. I start out broad like with what everybody knows and then go through and just try to pick out specifics like the name the date the place and then use whatever resources are available to narrow down specific information about those people that date that location that are mentioned and just you know continue wherever that leads me that's how i i use whatever resources I can find. Yeah. And I wouldn't say I use one more so than the other. Yeah. But um, I, I would say that we have used the obituary that you mentioned. I know specifically one case for unfound that we have not covered. Yeah. Where um, um, a gentleman is looking for his children and um, the children are specifically mentioned in a recent obituary. So, you know, all of those, all of the resources that you're talking about, I think I've used at some point. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's great. I mean, I mean maybe yeah. it's a more disorganized kind of way to do it, but I mean, it works for me somehow. Yeah. No, Sometimes. there's no doubt it works for you because again, you're, you're part of the important forward movement of, of unfound. There's no question for me staying organized is an actual problem, but I'm working on that for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Natasha, anything you'd like to share, a specific line of study or an example? Yes, um, at least with my friends and colleagues, everyone is on link LinkedIn, yeah. which is a job networking site. So perhaps the victim is, is on there, um, especially if it's a recent case. And uh, depending on their privacy settings, you're able to see either common contacts or an insight of where they were working or some people put their entire resume on there. So if you just search on, on names, um, LinkedIn has a plethora of information. Yeah. And I can also mention here, and again, I don't want to, because it's such a long episode, I can't remember every, every aspect of it, but um, in the Remmer case, and it's four hours, right? is, is in, and again, the very small part I played in that. Um, again, I can tell you for some of that work, fast, uh, fast people search, um, dot com was a site that uh, was very helpful um, and has continued to be helpful for, for other, fast people search dot com has, has continued to be helpful for sure for that. Tanya, did you have, uh, no, Tanya, we talked to you. Uh, Jessica, did I get your thoughts on this one? I usually um, kind of start with the basics and then, you know, work out and search that circle. I do a lot of newspapers.com, yes. social media, 
and try to find out what's currently going on with him and what's gone on with him in the past. Um, there's a case local to my area of a girl that's been missing um, for about 20 years. And if you go back and search um, the people around her, you'll find that um, one of her siblings have since con been convicted of murder. And, you know, there's just kind of, you find a lot of information when you start digging into people's um, lives from that point forward. Yeah. That's right. No doubt about it. Anyone else have anything to add before I move into another sort of longer, more specific example here? Okay. So I think one of the things we definitely have some consensus on here is, you know, we, we, we want to be as grounded, right? Grounded, unfound on the ground as possible. What do we know? Uh, whom can we reach? What can we read? Of course, as we've also talked about, we're always sifting through what's accurate and inaccurate, even in previous media reports. And again, one of the, the great things about Unfound is that Ed and the team are committed to that, that importance of public accuracy. Of course, there are things that could be publicly disputed. People are still trying to figure out. Great. That's, that's how it goes. So what do we know already? Sometimes though we run into a case, whether someone tells us about it or, or we read about it, it's like, wait, I need to talk to that person, right? And then we have to approach them. And like we talked about in the last episode, right? We have to determine, you know, do we, do we call them? Do we email them? Do we use social media? Do we write them a letter, right? Those sorts of things. What's going to be our approach? How are they going to talk to us? But, you know, I need to talk to person A. And that's so important because it seems in some way that they're a key person in this case, whether it's a family or a friend or something that was sort of involved in someone's life or um, maybe a law enforcement or some other professional that was involved, but they're just hard to find. Um, so it's like, okay, what do I know about that person? Maybe I don't know much. Maybe I know some. And so I just kind of have a composite here or a, of, of, of some, some uh, casework and, um, and so let's just say that that person's Betty Doe. Now for me, who, who's interested in a case that's an older case, right? Betty Doe is someone who is, is key to this case because maybe for a period of time, she knew a particular missing person in some way or another personally. And this Betty Doe might have information that might pertain to that person's disappearance, Okay. And so, and I'm, and I'm using the name Betty Doe here, which is generic. Now, I might know a little bit about Betty. Um, I might have some existing human sources that might be able to tell me something. Maybe or maybe not, Betty's name is mentioned in, in media or some other document. Okay, so I go with what I know. Maybe I don't know much. I know a little bit. And so with Betty, maybe I can start with, especially because maybe Betty was involved in this missing person's life you know, three, four decades ago. So that definitely at that point, a genealogical profile is going to be helpful. And, and I'm working under the assumption that Betty is still alive, right? So to the best of my knowledge, Betty's out there. Now for an older case, and I've identified this Betty Doe, it might be that, you know, who knows, maybe Betty has passed away. But at the time, I'm working under the assumption that Betty's still alive. And so I'm thinking, okay, so unless I see a death record or obituary for that specific person, right, I have to assume that she's out there and there's some way to reach her. Now, maybe I know Betty's last name is Doe, and I, and I know or have a sense through discussion that that, that, made, that was probably a married name. Okay, so on Ancestry, right, or FamilySearch.org or some other genealogical record, I'm going to look out there and see you know, if I have some approximate idea of where she lived or might have lived, I'm going to start looking through marriage records, you know, legal records for marriage, legal records for divorce, you know, other sorts of things. Now, of course, census records are tough, and I'm talking federal census records here, because with the laws and policies of the U.S. government, the, 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 old, the, the census that we have available now, the latest one is the 1940 census, for those of you that, that do any of that research. Now, Indeed, if you're trying to figure out someone's maiden name or where they're from, that, that information may be helpful. But in terms of where they were in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, right, there's, those census records are not available yet. 
Uh, they will be someday, but long after, you know, I need to find this person now. So I'm going to start looking through those sorts of records. And then I might discover along the way, well, at some point, you know, the man to whom that, that one person told me that Betty was married to uh, did, <clears throat> uh, and maybe that person told me that too, they had some, some recollections, did divorce someone. And maybe I start looking through some, some records and keep in mind in Ancestry.com, some, depending on the state and the location and the time, right, especially things that are forward in time, you may not always see the original record. There may be some uh, transcripted or aggregated information that can still be helpful because even with the minimal information, I might still see something like, oh, a maiden name, right? Let's say she remarried later, right? And I might say, indeed, maybe Betty's uh, maiden name was Smith. Okay, now all of a sudden I have something more to go off of, right? So Betty Doe's name, that's a name she had for some time. I, I discover through looking through those types of records that her name was Smith, maybe from the 60s and 70s into the 80s. I discovered that, oh, eventually she married someone with the name of John Jones, okay, because I see some commonalities. And now, okay, at that point, assuming that she changed her last name, Again, she's now Betty Jones. So I'm starting to build at least the possibility of a profile. Now, remember, the more common or the more unique the name, that's going to impact how, how, how much more difficult this can be. But hang in there. Success is always possible, right? Now, of course, when someone, whether they have, and again, in a marriage, outside a marriage, etc., obviously you're going to be on the lookout for children, birth records, other sorts of records that might indicate that because if you're trying to find someone, right, part of that might be reaching out to someone who knew them or who knows them, right? And that could be a, a, a child, a grown child, of course, at some point or some other relative. But by looking at those records, all of a sudden I see, oh yeah, Betty Doe by the 1980s or 90s married a man named John Jones. And of course now her name is Betty Jones or it's John and Betty Jones. Now I have right? And I start to learn more about her once I know specific where she's from. By the way, some of you know, one of the key things to know when you're looking for someone to the extent possible is their age and to the extent possible their birth date, the year and more specific if possible. Why? Because when you're matching records to see who might be actually that person, the closer you can get with more information, the better, right? Age, date of birth, location, etc. So once I have a decent picture of now who that Betty Jones is by the 1980s or 90s, right, based on an approximation of her age and something maybe more specific, uh, and then, then I'm into, well, what information do I have? Where might she live? Well, you know, we know that sometimes people move far away. Sometimes they don't move very far away. And of course, you have to make some educated guesses. But once you have a sense of where someone might live, based on that information, then all of a sudden, now I'm looking at, okay, I think this might be the person. Uh, I'm using my, my, you know, fast people search, my white pages, my Zaba search, and I'm starting to look for other connections, right? Do they live in a home? Do they live in a home that's on a, in a community residence area, right? One of those, those communities, like a gated community or, or whatever. Do those areas sometimes put out newsletters that talk about their residence? Are there people that are property managers or local security people or local uh, PR people for that community that, oh, if you were to re reach out to them and say, do you know this person? How might I reach this person, right? By the way, sometimes you look that up and you're on, on white pages and the, and the phone number might be unlisted or it might not be current. But by the way, you have an address. And if you're not able to reach out to someone by phone, maybe you might write a letter, okay? Uh, or whatever, okay? Now, not all people use Facebook, but as some of us have mentioned, right? Social media, social media. Maybe now if you, you have the name that you think is the name of the person you're looking for, you're looking on Facebook or LinkedIn, maybe they're being talked about. Remember, when you're on Facebook, you can search profile, you can search posts, you can search, you know, other sorts of things. And I was, and, and those, those are important things. LinkedIn, Twitter, right? They all have different search capacities. 
Well, once I start to have that, we're into our county records, right? If I have a sense that someone lives in a certain area, right? Now I can start looking at deed or title searches, right? In terms of those records, the ones that are, every county of course has different amounts of, of information, right? Uh, of course, depending on their age, right? In, in this case, that might not be something that's relevant to finding them now, but if it's something more recent or current, right? Where do they go to school? Where did they go to school, right? That's important. Where do they work? Are they involved in any church activities or community groups where I might find their name mentioned in newsletters or, or you know, other promotional material, right? And, and, and something completely unrelated to this, this type of work. I was reminded today by someone, again, totally unrelated about that, how that Facebook can, can uh, be used to, to, um, uh, to, to search posts about discussions and how that can be good. How about other ag agricultural and land records, right, that, that come up? That can be something that's very important to find someone's um, where they're at, right? So just walking through the decades, especially through those older cases, that Betty Doe, that characterization that I just used, right, is a process, is from a, definitely a particular case that at this point I'm, I'm not in a, in a point to speak to publicly, coupled with the composite of some other, some other cases that, that show how you can walk through that and find that material, walk through marriage records, divorce records, different things from specific states, uh, looking at those connections, finding a remarriage, finding a place where they might live, venturing a couple educated guests, looking that up, finding some information about the local area, and then back to newspapers.com and or other media sources. Sometimes you will find that person and or their spouse and or other people they know mentioned in the paper, right? And then you can know, oh yeah, that's, that's the person I'm looking for. Right, that's the person I'm looking for. Of course, no guarantee you're going to find a phone number. You might, you might not. You might have to communicate in other ways. But once you know where they're at and it's the person, you can you can certainly try. We mentioned social media. I don't want to lose that. Natasha, I'm going to start with this. Besides LinkedIn and Facebook, is there any others you want to mention? Oh, certainly. Um, I subscribe to a wide variety of podcasts. So I search uh, common podcasts for names because usually um, there may be a podcast that has already featured the victim. So I just deep dive into the actual podcast itself. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very good. Jessica, how about you? Anything you'd like to say about social media? I just tend to comb anybody that I can find relate, you know, that might be related to the case, their back post, post about them, um, maybe their friends. And yeah. that's kind of what I do. Yeah. Have you tried the Facebook search? Um, yep. I did post? a Facebook per search uh -huh, where I searched the posts. Yeah. And I've used that for, mentioned. yeah. And in the past, past, I've used that for, um, genealogical purposes too. I mean, it, it can be very helpful if you can find, you know, people out there talking about such and such for sure. Tanya, how about you? Any ideas on social media? No, no, no other ideas. Yep. Cherie? Uh, just one thing that I might add is, you know, you can search locations on Facebook as well as phone numbers Yeah. in the search bar. You know, sometimes people don't realize that, but you can certainly take advantage of that. And then, you know, on Instagram, you can look at pictures and see where the locations are from those pictures and sort of narrow things down that way sometimes. Yeah, that's right. Delane, anything you'd like to say about um, social media? Okay, that's okay. Kathy, anything you'd like to say about social media? Just kind of the obvious ones that no one has mentioned as of yet that I read quite a bit where a name might pop up, either Reddit or WebSleuth. I read those quite a bit. Yeah. So there's some little link, maybe a person's name or a location or an area, but you just never know where you're going to run into something that's useful. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's 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 absolutely true. You you have to be able to to put in the time and willing to rule things out and rule them in, and you never know where you're going to find things. I want to mention we were talking about other things. Let me mention in this one here, if you've ever been to FEC.gov, the Federal Election Commission, and if you go to campaign finance data and then just look up contributions from specific individuals. Now, keep in mind, there are some laws and or policies about, you know, how you can use this. Um, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm saying that. And, and, and I'm giving my opinion here. I'm not even speaking officially for Unfound. Certainly for, for, for ethical journalistic and or advocacy and or awareness perspectives um, that, that this material can be used. Um, now, keep in mind, again, you can read the FEC, right? They don't want you to use it for soliciting contributions or for commercial purposes. And, and I don't know exactly how they define that. I would assume they mean direct marking. But again, I'm not a lawyer. But this can be a way of finding, especially when you look at the organizations and then the donors, not just the HTML information, but when you look at the actual documents, you're able to see uh, material. So that, and if you go another website that actually puts together some of this same uh, material from government, uh, resources and that's opensecrets.org opensecrets.org and they do tend to exclude some of the information but by the way if you run a search on a name you'll see that they're still providing location information now I don't know how far back these databases go in terms of, of donations but I can tell you that it is a way of ascertaining location. Uh, as well as maybe other information. Um, so again, those sites could be helpful. Again, that is the fec.gov, and that's a, uh, and then you can the opensecrets.org um, for sure. Those are ones. Has anyone used those before to find anyone or find information about people? Okay, that's that's one I definitely wanted to mention um, for sure. Uh, another one, and this, this is more along the lines of documentary evidence. However, you never quite know. It's very helpful. Um, it, it, it's limited free access, but if you are a paid subscriber, uh, you can have more time with the records. And that's maryferrell.org, M-A-R-Y-F-E-R-R-E-L-L.org. Uh, granted, whatever your thoughts are about JFK issues, conspiracies, regardless, the value of this database is it's constantly updating. So remember, keep in mind things that might have been circumstantially or incidentally related to those, those investigations or questions are going to be in there too, including things pertaining to organized crime etc cetera, etc cetera. so you're able to search those documents now again if you're not a paid member um, you have limited daily access they limit to how much you can search per day but you could start to look at documents that may be relevant to the person who's missing or persons that knew that person that were missing especially with the older cases so that's a tremendous tremendous resource for sure um, as Obviously, we're all getting at this in different ways. And part of the challenge, the importance of all this is putting together the big picture, right? We're trying to, when we're finding someone and we're oh, someone that's really hard to find, we're looking at these websites, we need to make sure we have the right person. We're dealing with con uh, you know, less unique names, more unique names, you know, dealing with location information, right? How, what are what are some things or what are some things we have to be challenges or cautious about or or really understanding about when we're trying to to deal with fact and corroborating and context uh, natasha let's start with you uh, i'll pass okay tanya maybe our our safety yeah would come up i would say yeah safety is important Someone, you know, especially if you're trying to corroborate and you're talking to people and you're trying to verify that you're, you're someone gets the word, oh, this person's calling around, 
what are they up to? Why are they doing that? Right. That that's something. Cause remember as much as that we can find out about others, they're trying to find out about us maybe. So yeah, safety and security are important for sure. Cherie, how about you? Uh, one of the challenges definitely is trying to discern facts from fiction. Yeah. You know, just because you see it somewhere doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. Yeah. That's true. And the other thing to keep in mind, and we know this through, you know, cases and genealogy and everyday life. Sometimes people have recollections and multiple people have recollections and they might be all honestly striving to be truthful, but over time, sometimes our recollections go a little off. Um, and sometimes we have to, okay, we want to hear everyone. We want to listen, but we always have to be again, corroborating and weighing things. And so even in the case of Betty Doe, when I was interested in this sort of person and going off of what I knew or what one or, or two other persons knew about this type of persons. Most of those recollections were very helpful. There were some details that the, the, the person who had a recollection of someone who had a recollection that needed to be tweaked a bit. Now that's because I found these other records in these sort of cases. Now, granted, as we all know, sometimes documents could be off a little bit or mistakes, but generally, you start to see patterns and you just say, oh no, this, this is what happened. This is, that person was living here. But um, yeah, it's important to, to be um, as accurate and because that's accuracy is going to lead to efficiency because if I'm trying to find someone and, and I'm not sure where they've lived in the last five years, then the last known record of I had was from 10 years ago, right? And this person A said, well, I thought they did this or that. that, right? we, that accuracy is going to lead to more efficiently, effectively finding them. So the more quickly we can sort through fact and fiction, the better. So that's helpful. Delaying anything you'd like to add here? Okay. Jessica? No, I don't think so. Okay. Kathy? Uh, I think that fact versus fiction is a really big area because just on any cases that we do on Unfound, and when you're doing research on a case, there's just so much fiction or the person's not quite getting the details right. So if you can get really adept at when you're researching, you become more and more familiar as to what is probably fact and what is probably fiction and maybe like Delane was saying about keeping a notebook, that's yeah. a really good thing to do because it's, you're going to mix up when you're, especially when you're doing a lot of, and there's been over 170 cases on and found trying to remember the different little details. Uh, it's really good to document, document, document those kinds of things. And another thing I would say is when you're like calling people up, trying to find somebody or you, Betty Doe that was listed here, make sure you watch the disclosure, that you don't tell too much inform, give out too much information that that person really doesn't have a right to know. So always watch that disclosure. Yeah, that's a very good legal and ethical point for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. The fact from fiction component is very important. One of the things that we mentioned last time, and I've certainly learned this, and I'm sure some of you have, when you're reaching out to people and you're especially talking to that person whom you really wanted to talk to, remember they're also listening in one, if they really want to talk to you, maybe they're ascertaining what you're about and what you know. And if you're doing your research, including talking to people and talking to the right people, and you're demonstrating a working knowledge of fact versus fiction, right? That's only going to improve your credibility. Once, once you know that you've, you have an established, oh, this is the person I want to talk to, and I'm starting to develop some rapport, right? Well, if I'm really striving to be someone that's committed to what's true, and that really comes out, right, in the ethos or the credibility that I'm able to bring forward, for sure. But yeah, that sense of caution is, is very important. Want to mention another site or two here, folks. Now, this, these two are also very good for 
basic, not basic or advanced documents, but also could be helpful in terms of finding people, in terms of looking for affiliations. Of course, we've talked a lot about government records. Let's not forget about court records, okay? And again, when you're dealing with missing persons cases, right, you're dealing with people that, that know people that might be on all different sides of the law. Uh, so law.justia.com, J-U-S-T-I-A, law.justia.com. And then, of course, if you go to Google Scholar, scholar.google.com, and remember, you can, you can select case law, okay? And then from that, and you, it's not too hard to figure out, you can determine what types of courts that you want that case law to come from. So you can find court cases, okay? And what that's going to do, again, it might find people that you should be talking to, but if you know already know of someone that you're looking for, again, you know, not saying everyone you're looking for is going to have that sort of have that sort of uh, issue, or 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 be tied to a court case, but they might. And so again, networks, affiliations, who knows whom, for what reason, what's the context? Um, again, these sorts of things are important research anyway. A lot of what we're discussing, but it might be helpful in terms of figuring out. And, and sometimes those court cases might give information about the person that that's filling in a, a bigger, a bigger picture for you anyway. So does anyone here use Google Scholar, even the case law part, the court case part? Okay, so that's one to try. Scholar.google.com, what, someone's got their hand up. Yep, Cherie, go ahead. So I was just gonna say that I do use that sometimes for trying to find court records and case records. Yeah. Has it been helpful for finding someone specifically that you might be looking for? And if you're not, you don't have to get into a specific case here, but has it been helpful to say, oh, wait a second, that's someone that I, I do want to talk to or I should be talking to? Yeah, I think it has, um, you know, been helpful. Um, another one that you haven't mentioned, and it's kind of, I just recently found it, and it's really more like a liberal arts where they have like music and books and things like that. But archive.org, oh, they yeah. also catalog like old websites and stuff like that. Yes. So there might be some, you know, that could be beneficial to somebody as well. Oh yes. And that of course is, and let's just mention it here because it was mentioned and, and that's archive.org. And then specifically what's being discussed here. Besides, by the way, archive.org itself is a tremendous search thing, but the Wayback Machine. And so yes. if you're looking and for someone uh, or looking for something, it could be a forum post, it could be a website, it could be whatever, and it's now not available on the net. If you have some information about that site, there's a possibility it might be archived on the Wayback Machine. And that could be helpful. And again, these are things that can be helpful for finding people, finding documents, et cetera. So Cherie, that's tremendous, right? Archive.org, A-R-C-H-I-V-E.org. Don't forget folks, we're gonna have a list of this that we're all talking about. So yeah, that's, that's very helpful, archive.org. Um, the, there is a site and he's it's a great site and it's an open source intelligence which a lot of what we're discussing tonight has to do with open source intelligence and has to do with we are also talking about things that deal with social media intelligence which is you know and i mean from an open source standpoint so things that are out there available of course we want to use it ethically and legally but it's out there and it's something that is, and it's not just finding the information, but it's analyzing it. And, you know, maybe more in the future, we'll talk about, oh, we will talk more about it. Maybe in the references, I'll, I'll throw some resources about it, but open source Intel. So inteltechniques.com, I-N-T-E-L techniques.com. The gentleman that runs that site, it's a tremendous site. And he has some, some tools that, and you can just go to that site and see some tools he has um, that that actually can be helpful in terms of finding people, um, and it's 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 a good site, 
and um, check it out at some point. Again, Intel, I-N-T-E-L, techniques, T-E-C-H-N-I-Q-U-E-S dot com. And uh, you can go through that site. Some good resources on there for sure. Um, one other one I want to mention, and this is only the federal level, okay? BOP.gov, the inmate locator. Uh, BOP.gov, inmate locate. Well, if you go to the Federal Bureau of Prisons website, you can find it. And um, that will give you, and you have to have at least, at least I think they force you to have first and last name, but I'm not sure. But, you know, you might, if, if you're in a situation where you're trying to find someone who might be an inmate. Now, there are state level databases that vary by state uh, in terms of available information. Okay. But, you know, you might be looking to talk to someone who is an inmate, right, or was an inmate, right? And you're trying to put together a profile of where they were, or where they're at, and, you know, that might be important information. Has anyone ever used any of these inmate locators, even state level? Cherie, have you um, ever used that? I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, the one I use is VineLink, and VineLink, you can – it's a free service and you can register your information and they will not only can you see where they are you, but you can set up a way to talk to them and you can get notifications like if they're transferred or you know and that, it shows what their their charges are and all of that that is that vine link yeah v-i-n-e-l-i-n-k okay and that dot and com a, that? i believe it's dot com Okay, well, we'll look into that. We'll make sure to keep that on the on the list. That's helpful for sure. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, we might or might not mention in a previous episode, I don't know, um, is uh, USA.gov, USA.gov. Now that's, again, helpful for general research, but remember, there's a search function at the top and that could lead, if not necessarily contact information, although it might, but if you're looking to say, oh, is this, maybe this person was involved in such and such or works for something tied to government or had some issue tied to government, you know, it's going to be in there, right? If you're trying to find someone, as one or two of you indicated, right, you use the resources that are available, USA.gov, USA.gov, right on the top of the screen, there's a search function there. And same as when you're using Google, you can specify with quotes, et cetera, and, and know your terms, know your names, et cetera. And, and that will, that can be helpful. One of the things I also want to mention, and this comes up when you're doing, again, document research, trying to find people, don't forget spelling variations. Sometimes that comes up. And, uh, you know, and, and if, you know, sometimes when we're looking for someone and, and sometimes we know we have a, a good sense of how that name is spelled, but especially if it's a more complicated name, right? Well, like Krabowski, right? Sometimes many people spell it with an I, mine spelled with a Y. Okay, when you're looking at these, these, especially these, you know, aggregated databases, just making sure you have the right person and were there any variations used, uh, et cetera. Of course, we all know sometimes people use aliases Sometimes people's name change for marriage reasons or other reasons. And those are all things we have to account for in staying organized, right, along the way. Um, Tanya, is there anything? We have 15 minutes, folks. And this has been, uh, this is just tremendous material. Um, Tanya, is there anything you'd like to ask or, or, or say uh, as we wind things down tonight? Um, I, <clears throat> these conversations are very helpful. And, um, as, as, you know, everybody was talking, I was thinking about, um, you know, like, I don't know, I just had an idea that probably exists and it's a little bit of what you guys do behind the scenes now, I'm sure. But I was thinking about, you know, a group of people or groups of people in different areas that maybe come together like this on zoom or, by phone or whatever. And maybe one person brings a case to the group that they really want to um, investigate. And the group takes, maybe they take a week or two weeks or whatever to all do their own type of research. 
you know, certain people are better at looking at different websites or different types of things than others. And maybe they all use their strengths to then come back together in a week or two weeks with all the information, contact info and everything that they've found, each one of them. They share that. Somebody writes everything down, contact information, you know, the phone number, names, work history, you know, whatever. And then that person that's very interested, of course, they're participating as well because they're also doing research. But the person that brought the case to begin with, um, they have all that information and then they can move forward and start, you know, calling people, contacting people um, and that kind of thing. Just the thought that came up because it seems it's very helpful to work with, you know, this is helpful because there's no question that has been in, again, the back of my mind, and, and we need to keep talking about it more, is how can we bring, again, collaboration, crowdsourcing, et cetera. And if you have a group of passionate, dedicated, and serious people like this group who would want to do that sort of work, um, yeah, I think that's something we're going to, we need to continue talking about. And I, it's good that you're keeping that on our minds going forward. Cherie, is there anything you'd like to state and or ask as we wind down? I just wanted to say that I appreciate this. I'm glad that I was able to participate in new resources, um, things that I have not even heard of that I can, you know, now add to places that I can look. And also to say to Tanya, that is something that we are kind of working on um, behind the scenes on Unfound, um, maybe making that happen. And so maybe you can be a part of that. Well, that would be great. I would love it. Thank you. Yeah. And we have mentioned so many great things tonight and I'm going to once this is, this is, I'm going to, we're going to listen through this and, and again, continue to create a list. So this is all helpful um, for sure. Uh, Delane, anything you'd like to state and or ask as we wind down? Um, not particularly, except for um, the last comments that Tanya and Cherie made. I thought were really great. Yeah, those are, those are definitely some really great ideas yeah jessica how about you anything you'd like to state and or ask before we wind down no i not anything particular okay that's okay kathy anything you'd like to state and or ask before we wind down and eric you are creating a list of all the different websites that people have mentioned or that you have mentioned I am. We're going to, just like today okay. when I, just like, uh, well, for number, the second episode, and that was obviously much shorter. This one's going to be a lot longer, all the references. So everything that I mentioned that you all mentioned tonight, I'm going to listen through the material again, get them all down, and then send them to Natasha and Ed, and then they'll post them somewhere, just like number two will be posted soon. Okay, great, great. Because I've learned a lot by everything that everybody's brought up, but I would I would just want to add that I personally, what Tanya suggested, I would be very interested in participating in a group like that. I would love to do that. Yeah, yeah I would too also, Kathy. Yeah, it's, yeah, no, and this is something that needs to, to continue as proactive discussion. N Natasha, is there anything you'd like to state and or ask as we wind down? Oh, sure. I'm really enjoying uh, what I consider a wonderful case study on finding sources. Uh, this is on Crawl Space podcast, and okay. it's uh, Laura Rist that is being interviewed for the Trini Lynn Gibson uh, missing person case. She went missing in 1976. So it also is very interesting to see how the times have changed and the challenges of uh, find it, of trying to find information from from that time period but uh yeah she's interviewed on crawl space it's linda wrist uh she never really had any affiliation with uh trini before it was just something in her picture that really drew her and uh it's it's motivating i think for our audience because she has a job uh as uh 
as a cook, I guess like a gourmet cook, but yeah. at the same time, uh, she's mostly known as we're, we're all mostly known for our URLs now. Uh, her blog is Canadian Girl 77. Uh, G U R L is how you spell the girl. Uh, but it just completely reminded me of what we're trying to do here and listening to it from that perspective, how she's even able to inter interview uh, people from her class. And, yeah. And is able to discern between, you know, the juniors and the seniors and how a group of seniors has this certain kind of aura about them. It's just absolutely fascinating. So it's just that, that recommendation. Yeah, no, that's, that was, um, that's helpful. And that's going to be on our list too. Um, let me say, did I miss anyone before I? Okay. Um, let me say this the the degree to what one wants to take this is obviously someone has to like we talked about last time and certainly indicate this time that's something right their own comfort level so again training and development and you know that's something you know thanks to a few of you have hinted at and we're going to continue to talk about and find what you're comfortable with develop that rapport as you as you reach out to people and and i know last time i mentioned you know the, the new digital ways, but we can't forget the old fashioned ways. And with the, the Michelanco, Michael Anko case, and in, to a smaller extent, the Phoebus homicide case, I'm going to need to do this again with Donna's case, just going to the area. And, and I'm not even talking, I know last, if we've talked about the issue of meetings and, and that's important, but just going around. And, and again, this isn't for everyone and I'm not saying what you should or shouldn't do, but, um, especially if it's a smaller town area or a neighborhood. And again, folks, keep in mind safety, security, wherever you go. You know, if you're going to an area, even if it's an older case, right, that people might or might not have heard about, you can do some door-to-door, face-to-face networking. Um, now, you may not necessarily have in mind who you, you want to talk to, and I'm not saying you want to just show up on someone's door unless that's absolutely necessary, but... If you're trying to ascertain who might I want to talk to and then figure out some, some interest, you know, just kind of figure out paths to finding them, human sources. And so this is sort of a combination of our number two and number three episodes. Being in that area, and again, cautiously, can be helpful. I can tell you that that was helpful for some forward movement for me. Um, I need to do more of that. Obviously, like I said before, with cases in North Dakota, weather can be an issue. And now with, with COVID, that sort of stuff becomes a real challenge. But a lot of these sources we're talking about are, are digital, which is great, right? The, for all the, the pros and cons, and there are many cons of the internet, the pros can be using it in positive ways to help solve these cases. I can tell you with that Betty Doe example, which was, you know, guided by one case mainly, and then with sprinkling in of some others for a composite, right? That information and that finding of that Betty Doe led to some somewhat significant forward movement, definitely from a personal level and possibly, possibly from a, a, a case study level. And that's still in process and being determined and ongoing learning. It's that's depending on the age of the case, depending on location, all the things we've talked about, knowing that information, that's important. And all of these sources tonight, I've learned so much. I've learned some new sources and this has been a great discussion and Ed and the team or including myself are so uh, appreciative of, of having this opportunity with, with think tank folks. And uh, thank you again. So this concludes our unfound on the ground number three, researching and analyzing missing persons cases, part two, finding human sources. Thank you for your time, folks. Have a great night and have a great week and be safe out there in this COVID world.